People thought the Beatles were huge rock stars. They were very popular, very skilled, and completely changed music forever. But they had good and bad times like everyone else. Even with all their fame and glory, the Fab Four's life wasn't always easy. It's been over 50 years since the Beatles broke up today. Right now, Paul McCartney is telling the truth about what happened. Who broke up the Beatles? So why did they fight and whine so much? How did they keep making such great music when they were making each other crazy? What is Paul McCartney doing now? Come with us as we get into this and more. People thought that Paul McCartney was the one who broke up the Beatles for 50 years. When he put out his first record by himself in April 1970, everyone was shocked to hear that the Fab Four were no longer together. However, he says John Lennon left the band, not him. Who did the Beatles break up? McCartney is still seen as the bad guy by history. In October 2121, he told the BBC. That's what people saw, so I had to live with it. I could only say no Yoko Ono. So why did people blame Paul McCartney for breaking up the most popular band ever? Why does he still want to change the story after 50 years? When the Beatles stopped performing in August 1966, it was the beginning of the end for them. Even though this was the best time for their music career with Sgt. Pepper, it meant that they didn't spend as much time together as they did during the height of Beatlemania. All four members got interested in new things and met new people outside of the band. Yoko Ono, John Lennon's partner, was his most well-known new friend. They met in May 1968. A common story in rock music is having a partner in a band. This is often seen as the reason why bands break up. This is very true for the Beatles. It was hard for John and Yoko in late 1968 and early 1969. They had drug problems, lost a baby and were treated badly by people in Britain. But these things made their relationship better. Jackson's work, though, shows that the other. This didn't surprise the Beatles. While they were recording in January 1969, Paul McCartney said, They're making a big deal out of this John does that all the time, though. People will find it funny 50 years from now to say they broke up because Yoko sat on an amplifier. Even while it was going on, the four Beatles thought there were more than just Yoko's reasons for the band to break up. Did you know that Ringo Starr was the first member of the band to leave? White Album was being made by the Beatles in August 1968. During that time, drummer Ringo Starr was so unhappy with his role in the band that he quit for two weeks. In the documentary anthology, Ringo said, I didn't. I thought I played well. And I could tell the other three were having a great time while I was by myself. There wasn't any magic and we didn't get along. But Starr came back, and they worked on the album some more. When George Harrison worked on Get Back in January 1969, things were really hard for him. After putting out the White Album in October, the musician went to see Bob Dylan and the band in Woodstock. He thought it was great that they all worked together to make songs. When he got back to London with John and Paul, his songs were ignored while John and Paul worked on their own unfinished projects. Everything came to a head because many of George's songs, like something were better than anything else the band was working on. On January 10th, 1969. George told the other Beatles members he was going after a fight at lunch. Even though they said mean things about Eric Clapton taking his place, the other Beatles still asked George to meet with them. They decided that Harrison would come back if they didn't go to the live show and instead made an album. So how did they finally say goodbye? Ways? This is the end of the Beatles. When John Lennon quit in September 1969, it was the end of the Beatles for good. From spring to summer 1969, the four Beatles got back together to make another record. This one was called Abbey Road when they were done with it, Lennon. McCartney and Harrison met on September 9th to plan their next move. A tape was made of the meeting so Ringo could listen to it later. Lennon suggested on the tape that they make another album with more songs for George and asked Paul to leave out some of his more famous songs. Like Maxwell's Silver Hammer in an interview, Paul said, when we get in the studio. You know, even on the worst days, Ringo is still playing drums and I'm still playing bass. That same week, though, Lennon and Yoko Ono went to Canada with Eric Clapton to play in a band at the Toronto Rock and Roll Festival. They played some of John's new songs by himself. It was that weekend. I made the choice to quit the Beatles for good. I want to divorce Lennon said at a meeting with their record company, EME, on September 20th to sign a new deal. Paul McCartney wrote an anthology that John had told him, I wasn't going to tell you until after we signed the contract, but I'm leaving the group our jaws dropped, and we signed the new deal while still being shocked. Another important reason why the Beatles. 
The reason they broke up was because of a sad event in August 1967. Brain Epstein, who had been their manager for five years, died suddenly, leaving a lot of business problems. Around the same time, the band started their own business called Apple Corps to handle their money. But they spent too much and needed a new boss to get their finances back in order. Paul wanted his father-in-law's business to be in charge, but John George and Ringo picked Alan Klein, a famous American businessman, worked with music artists. Klein helped them get a better deal with their record company, so they didn't tell anyone John was going. Klein was good at business and got the Beatles more money. They're making more money than ever from their songs. Things were still not right, though. When Northern Songs, the company that put out Lennon and McCartney's music, went on the market, they missed the chance to own their own songs. Because of this mistake, Michael Jackson owned the songs in the 1980s. Things got worse, though. Little Richard liked Klein, but Paul didn't want him to handle his money. When the fight got really bad. After that, Paul did something. But what did he really do? Moved by Paul McCartney, in the late 1960s when the Beatles' Paul McCartney's move were starting to drift apart, each member went on their own artistic paths. John Lennon, who was always. He started a new project called the Plastic Ono Band. He is known for being daring. This was very different from what he did with the Beatles before. Lennon wanted to explore and share his unique artistic vision with this new project. Paul McCartney was working on a very private matter. He started working on his first release by himself, but he did it under a fake name. For privacy and to keep the mystery surrounding his project, he went by the name Billy Martin. This let McCartney work on his music without any outside help, force, or effect. During this time, John Lennon wanted to work on some old songs from the sessions with the Beatles. That is, he asked producer Phil Spector to help him work on the Get Back tapes from the previous year. They planned to put out an album with some of the band's unused songs on it but McCartney did not like how things turned out. He was. He was especially upset about how Spectre had treated the tapes. McCartney thought that Spectre's way of working involved adding a lot of extra music to his songs that wasn't needed, which took away from how simple and raw they were in the first place. Things got worse in the morning of April 10, 1970, when the British newspaper The Daily Mirror made a shocking report that was felt all over the world. Paul quits the Beatles, said the music world. This story pointed to a major turning point. Paul McCartney had already chosen to leave the band, and now it was official he had left. John Lennon, on the other hand, did not like this news. He had meant to tell everyone that the Beatles had broken up more than six months ago, but the news had been pushed back. Now McCartney's leaving was making news, and Lennon felt insulted by the timing. Later that same year, John Lennon tried to get even in his own way. He was honest and angry in an interview with Rolling Stone that pushed and broke down how people thought about the Beatles. During this conversation, Lennon said some very harsh things about comments about the band's look and how they worked together. He said, to make it, you had to be a jerk. And the Paul McCartney letter Beatles were the jerks jerks in the world. His anger was also directed at how his ex-bandmates treated his partner, Yoko Ono. Lennon spoke out against them. They all sat there like a fucking jury and judged us. I'll never forgive them, he said. Paul McCartney, on the other hand, decided to deal with the situation more calmly, even though things were getting worse. His goal was to stay out of public arguments and instead take a more direct method. Paul McCartney wrote a sent a letter to the letters page of the Melody Maker to stop the rumors that they might get back together. He was very clear in his letter to put an end to the limping dog of a news story that has been dragging itself across your pages for the past year. My answer to the question, will the Beatles get together again, is no. The apple pot Paul McCartney sues the other. Now, the Beatles' business manager, Alan Klein, made sure that all of the money made by each member's solo projects would go into an apple pot. This was supposed to make sure that everyone in the group shared in the money. But over time, Paul McCartney felt that this arrangement was getting in the way of his creative and financial freedom. He did not like how his solo work was being managed or how it affected his personal finances. That's why, in August 1970, McCartney started the process of ending the partnership of the Beatles. He said that his freedom to make his own artistic and financial decisions was important to him. Existing contracts and collective agreements were making it hard to solve the problem, no matter how hard he tried. The only way to break the deadlock was to go to court. 
On December 31, 1970, McCartney took a big step by filing a lawsuit in the London High Court against his former bandmates John Lennon, George Harrison, and Paul McCartney. Harrison, Ringo Starr, and Apple Corp., the company that ran their business. The lawsuit asked for the official dissolution of the Beatles and all of their related businesses. The case went on for a long time, into the early 1970s, because it was so complicated and important. Finally, after a long court battle, the judge ruled in favor of McCartney. This meant that the Beatles were no longer a legal entity. The official end of the Beatles was on December 29, 1974. From that point on, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, and George Harrison would no longer be in the band. George Harrison, Ringo Starr, and Paul McCartney were recognized as four separate people, not as members of a single band. The Beatles, the groundbreaking group that changed rock music forever, were now officially broken up. This was the end of an era and the start of a new one in the... Just like that, Paul McCartney went off on his own. What did he do after the band was over? Life after the Beatles. When the Beatles broke up in the late 1960s and early 1970s, Paul McCartney was depressed. The end of the band, which had been such an important part of his life, was a big blow to him. Life in general was very hard on him. During this difficult time, McCartney's wife Linda was very important in helping him get through it. She praised his songwriting skills and pushed him to keep writing and recording music. As a tribute to Linda's support and the important role she played in his life, McCartney wrote the heartfelt song, Maybe I'm Amazed. The song's words show how thankful and amazed he is that Linda is helping him get through this hard time. He said, that's how I felt. Maybe I'm amazed at what's going on. Hey dot, hey dot, hi, if I'm a man, you might be the only woman who can help me. Baby, won't you help me understand? Hey dot, hey dot, you pulled me out of time and hung me on the line. That's something that amazes me. How I really need you. McCartney also said, every love song I write is for Linda, which shows how much her support meant to him. In 1970, McCartney started his solo career by releasing his first album, which was simply called McCartney. It was a huge hit, reaching number one on the U.S. charts. It was mostly a solo project, with McCartney writing the songs, playing the instruments, and singing. Linda added some vocals, but McCartney did most of the work on the album himself. The next year, he continued his solo journey by working on a second album called Ram with Linda and drummer Denny Sywell. This album also did well, reaching number one in the U.K. and the top five in the U.S. One of its standout tracks, Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey became a U.S. number one hit. Later that same year, McCartney expanded his musical career by forming a new band called Wings with Linda and guitarist Denny Lane, who had been in the Moody Blues before. McCartney said, Wings were always a difficult idea when he thought about how hard it was to start a new group. Hey dot hey dot it would be hard for any group to follow in the Beatles' footsteps. Hey dot hey dot I was in the same situation. But there was a choice between ending or going on, and I love music too much to think about ending. Stella McCartney was born in September 1971, the couple's daughter. Stella was named after Linda's grandmothers, both of whom were named Stella. This new time in McCartney's life was filled with happiness and continued musical creativity. Wings on tour, wings on tour. It was 1972, and Paul McCartney's new band, Wings, started their first concert tour with the addition of guitarist Henry McCullough. Their first show was at the University of Nottingham, where they played for a small crowd of 700 people. The band's early tour was unplanned and focused on playing at different colleges. They went from one gig to the next in a van and stayed in simple places along the way to keep costs low and keep a casual vibe. They were paid in small change from students at each venue. It's interesting that they didn't play any Beatles songs during these shows instead, they focused on their new music. McCartney later talked about why they chose this approach, saying that he wanted to avoid the pressure. There would be a lot of attention from the press and the public, who might make negative comments about his time with the Beatles. The main thing I didn't want was to go on stage and have five rows of press people with little pads looking at me and saying, oh, McCartney said, well, he's not as good as he used to be. The university tour helped him calm down and gain confidence again. So we decided to go on that tour, which made me feel better, he said. Hey dot, hey dot, I was ready for something different after that tour. So we went to Europe. As part of the Wings Over Europe tour, which took place in Europe for seven weeks, the band played. There were 25 shows on this tour, and Wings mostly played their own songs and McCartney's solo work. They only played one Beatles song, 
A cover of Little Richard's Long Tall Sally McCartney chose to avoid big venues on purpose, instead choosing to play in smaller rooms that could hold fewer than 3,000 people. This helped the band keep the setting small and connect more directly with their fans. In March 1973, Wings Paul. McCartney's band celebrated a big win when My Love became their first number one song in the U.S. This song was on their second album, Red Rose Speedway, which was also a hit, going to number one in the U.S. and making it to the top five in the U.K. They worked together with Linda and George Martin on this record. John McCartney's Linda and George Martin, a former Beatles producer, worked together to make the song Live and Let Die, which was the theme song for the same name James Bond movie. The song got a lot of attention and praise, going to number two in the U.S. charts and number nine in the U.K. It was nominated for an Academy Award, and Martin won a Grammy for his orchestral work on it. The song was praised by music professor and author Vincent Benitez, who called it symphonic rock at its best as the band grew. They had some staff changes. In 1973, guitarist Henry McCullough and drummer Denny Sywell left, and McCartney, Linda, and guitarist Denny Lane recorded the album Band on the Run, which became a big hit. This was the first of seven platinum albums by Wings. Band on the Run topped the charts in both the US and the UK, making it the band's first album to do so. It also made history by appearing on Billboard magazine's charts three times. The album stayed on the UK charts for an impressive 124 weeks, and was named one of. Rolling Stone named Band on the Run one of the best albums of the year in 1975. The title track won McCartney and Wings a Grammy Award for Best Pop Vocal Performance, and the album's engineer, Jeff Emerick, won a Grammy for Best Engineered Recording. Wings won more awards in 1974 with the second number one hit in the U.S., also called Band on the Run this album had more top 10 hits, like Jet and Helen Wheels, and was named 418th on Rolling Stone's list of the 500 greatest albums of all time. During this time, McCartney also changed the band's lineup by hiring Jimmy McCulloch as a guitarist. McCullough and Sywell were replaced by guitarist Geoff Britton and drummer Geoff Britton. However, Britton quit during recording sessions in 1975, and Joe English took his place. After the success of their album Band on the Run, Wings did even better with their next albums. In 1975, they released Venus and Mars, which topped the charts. The next year, they released Wings at the Speed of Sound, which also topped the charts. That same year, Wings also started the Wings Over the World Tour, a 14-month trip that took them around the world and took them to places like the UK, Australia, Europe, and the United States. States. It was a big deal for McCartney because it was the first time he played live Beatles songs with Wings. Five Beatles hits were on the set list for their two-hour shows I've Just Seen a Face Yesterday, Blackbird Lady Madonna, and The Long and Winding Road. The tour also had a big part in the U.S. with an ambitious arena tour. At the end of the tour, Wings Over America, a triple live record that went straight to number one on the U.S. charts, was released. It captured the energy and excitement of the tour and showed off Wings' impressive live performances. That was just the start of his success he went on to work with Stevie Wonder and other great artists. In 1982, Paul McCartney began a string of successful collaborations with other artists. He worked with Stevie Wonder on the song Ebony and Ivory A. This song was McCartney's 28th single to top the Billboard Hot 100 chart. He also worked with Michael Jackson on the song The Girl Is Mine, which was on Jackson's hugely popular album Thriller. The next year, McCartney released his own album. McCartney continued to work with Jackson on the song Say Say Say, which was a big hit and became his most recent U.S. number one hit as of 2014. That same year, the title track of McCartney's album Pipes of Peace, which came out in 1983, became his most recent U.K. number one. In 1984, McCartney made his film debut with the musical Give. My regards to Broad Street. He not only acted in the movie but also wrote and produced it. Ringo Starr had a small part in the movie. Unfortunately, Give My Regards to Broad Street was not a hit. Although critics liked the movie, the soundtrack album did not do as well at the box office. Variety called it characterless, bloodless, and pointless and Roger Ebert gave it one star, suggesting that viewers skip the movie and go straight to the soundtrack. It was a big hit, going to number one in the UK and hitting number 10 in the US with No More Lonely Nights which had led guitar by David Gilmer of Pink Floyd. Then, in 1985, McCartney was. 
Warner Brothers asked McCartney to write a song for the comedy Spies Like Us, which he did in just four days. Phil Ramone co-produced the song. That same year, McCartney also performed at Live Aid, which was a huge and important event for charity. As McCartney sang B technical problems made it hard to hear him sing and play the piano for the first two verses, with feedback interspersed. The problems were eventually fixed, and David Bowie, Allison Moyet, Pete Townshend, and Bob Geldof joined him on stage. The crowd cheered loudly, making the performance a memorable part of the event. McCartney's musical experiments and new ventures. In 1991, Paul McCartney took a big step into the world of orchestral music. In honor of the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Society's 150th anniversary, McCartney was asked to write a new piece of music. He worked with composer Carl Davis on this project, which led to the creation of the Liverpool Oratorio. The Oratorio featured famous opera singers such as Kiriti Kanawa, Sally Burgess, Jerry Hadley, and Willard White, with the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra and the Choir of Liverpool Cathedral. Despite the performance's fame, the Liverpool Oratorio got mixed reviews from critics. The Guardian was especially harsh, calling the music afraid of anything approaching a fast tempo and saying it lacked. There were awareness of the need for recurring ideas that will bind the work into a whole in response. McCartney wrote a letter that was published by the paper. In it, he talked about the faster parts of the piece and said that he thought many good pieces of music were not liked by the critics of the time stressed that he was happy for people to decide for themselves how good the work was. After its premiere in London, the Liverpool Oratorio was performed all over the world and became a hit on the UK classical chart, reaching number one on Music Week. That same year, McCartney also appeared on MPV Unplugged, playing acoustic songs. This performance was turned into a live album called Unplugged the Official Bootleg. In the 1990s, McCartney tried new musical directions through solo projects and collaborations. He worked twice with Youth of Killing Joke as the firemen their first project together was an electronica record called. Strawberry's Ocean Ships Forest came out in 1993, and McCartney also put out a rock record that same year called Off the Ground. The New World Tour followed, and later that year Paul is Live, a live album, came out. What has he been up to recently? Paul McCartney released his 18th solo album. McCartney III, on December 18th, in the last few months of what has he been up to recently 2000, Capitol Records. This album was a big deal, because it was McCartney's first number one solo album in the UK since Flowers in the Dirt, which also came out in 1989. McCartney III was recorded in England during the COVID-19 lockdowns and continued his tradition of. Two self-titled solo albums, McCartney played all the instruments himself, showing how versatile he was and how much he loved his job. After McCartney III came out, in April, an album of reinterpretations, remixes, and covers called McCartney III Imagine came out. On November 16, 21, this companion album had new versions of the original tracks from McCartney III, giving fans new interpretations and arrangements. In November 21, McCartney released the lyrics 1956 to the present, which was called A. Self-Portrait in 154 Songs The book is based on conversations McCartney had with Irish poet Paul Muldoon and gives readers a look into McCartney's songwriting and personal thoughts. The lyrics was a huge hit and was named Book of the Year by both Barnes Noble and Waterstones, a major cultural figure. McCartney's Got Back Tour, which took place from April 28th to June 16th, 2002, was his first trip back to the United States since leaving the country in 1980. After a break since 1999, the tour ended with a historic performance on June 25, 2012, at the Glastonbury Festival, just one week after McCartney turned 82. He made history by being the first person to appear on the Pyramid stage. The show was the oldest solo headliner at the festival, and Dave Grohl and Bruce Springsteen joined in as special guests, making it an even more memorable event. That same year, McCartney won a Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Documentary or Nonfiction Series at the 74th. Paul won the Primetime Creative Arts Emmy Award for producing the documentary The Beatles Get Back, which looked at how the Beatles made music and showed how influential McCartney is still today. This and many other things he did made him by far the most. Thanks for watching. Let us know what you think in the comments below, and don't forget to watch the next video that comes up.